even if Quinn Ewers is healthy enough to start against Mississippi State, should he? You are Locked On Longhorns, your daily podcast on the Texas Longhorns. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Locked on Longhorns, the show. Jonathan Davis, your host. Today's episode of Locked on Longhorns brought to you by FanDuel. Place your first $5 bet. You'll get started with $200 in bonus bets guaranteed. So visit FanDuel.com to get started. On today's episode of Locked on Longhorns, should Arch Manning start against Mississippi State if Quinn Ewers is healthy enough to play? Second segment, Longhorns in the NFL through three games for almost every team. I'm recording this before Bills, Jaguars, and commanders Bengals, right but you know most of the longhorns in the nfl the prominent ones have played three games so how they've done in the first three games of the 2024 season and then in the last segment we're about five weeks away from the college basketball season so we go through the texas men's basketball schedule each game on the schedule we go through each one all of that and more on today's episode of locked on longhorns part of the locked on podcast network your team every day So when we look at Quinn Ewers, you know, he hurt his oblique in the UTSA game. And, you know, it was described as week to week. We keep hearing that, you know, he's feeling better than expected. He's doing better, moving around really well. Um, But it's still week to week. Right. And, you know, this will come out on Tuesday. We probably won't know about his status officially for the game until maybe Thursday or Friday, depending on, uh, you know, when Steve Sarkeesian feels like telling us, (laughs) you know, Quinn Ewers status. We know that. At times, especially with Quinn Ewers, they've kind of, you know, kept things close to the vest. And it's always been week to week. And we've always found out later in the week whether Quinn Ewers would play or not. Now, you know, this exercise, if Art should start this week or Quinn Ewers, solely depends on Quinn Ewers being healthy enough for this to actually be a decision. I think that, you know, from the moment he went down, their focus was let's make sure he's healthy enough and good enough to come back for the Oklahoma game. Right. But let's say there's a scenario where Quinn Ewers is healthy you know, feels like he's good enough to play or is fighting to play this Saturday, right? The question then becomes, should Quinn Ewers start? Should Sark and the team allow Quinn Ewers to start? Or should they put Arch Manning out there for one more week and give Quinn Ewers two more weeks of rest? Because remember, we have a bye week after Mississippi State heading into the Oklahoma game. Give him two additional weeks of rest leading up to the Red River shootout. And my answer is, (laughs) I think, that Arch Manning should start this week, even if Quinn Ewers is healthy enough to go. Like I said, Quinn Ewers still week to week. But when you look at it, we play this Mississippi State team on Saturday. Obviously, this is, you know, your SEC opener, right? It's the first game in the SEC for the Texas Longhorns. And it should be or normally would be an upgrade in competition, right? You already played Michigan week two. Obviously, Michigan is better than Mississippi State. But you've also played ULM, UTSA, and Colorado State, right? And so, you know, with Mississippi State being an SEC team, they have, you know, blue chip players. You know, I don't know if they have any five stars, right? But they got, you know, some decent transfers and some four star recruits. You would expect this to be a tougher game, right? A game that, you know, Texas, you know, will have to, I shouldn't say that. I mean, you know, regardless of the opponent, Texas is going to have to show up and show out. And that's why they've been the number one team in the country. But you would expect this to be a challenge, right? Any game in the SEC where it just means more of the toughest conference in college football. But going into this game where we don't know Quinn Ewer's status, Texas is favored currently by 38 and a half points in large part because Blake Shapin, the starting quarterback, former quarterback at Baylor, starting quarterback for Mississippi State, has gone down with an injury. So an SEC team, Mississippi State, that is in a huge rebuild, just got smacked by Florida at home, lost to Toledo the week before by 19 points. Texas is favored against them by 38 and a half points, right? So you're going into this game as your SEC opener, and it's probably largely going to feel like the games that you played previously, (laughs) right, in the non-conference slate, the ULM, UTSA, and Colorado State games. At least Vegas feels like it's going to be like that because, like I said, they're favored, the Texas Longhorns, number one team in the country, by almost 40 points against Mississippi State at home this Saturday. And so when you look at it, The question is, do you think, and I mean, obviously, you know, Vegas does, do you think that Arch Manning could start against Mississippi State, still be fine, Texas still win, you know, comfortably, and Quinn Ewers be allowed to get that extra couple of weeks of rest leading up to the tougher part of the schedule against Oklahoma 
and Georgia. I know Oklahoma doesn't look great right now, and Georgia doesn't necessarily look like Georgia. Those are still going to be two very tough games and two games, you know, that Texas really needs to win to, you know, maintain their number one team in the country status, make it to the SEC championship game, and then put themselves in the best position to advance far in the playoffs. The reason I think that Arch Manning should start this week is because even though he struggled at times against ULM in his, his first start, right? We saw some of the elite playmaking, throwing the ball down the field, the athleticism we've seen over the last couple of weeks. But he also only completed 52% of his passes and turned the ball over twice, right? And so you have to question you know, what type of start or, you know, what type of game will Arch Manning have and will the rest of the team be good enough to overcome Arch if he has a bad game, right? If you have a bad game from your quarterback that has, you know, relatively no experience up until this point, especially compared to Quinn Ewers, will Texas still be able to go out there and beat this Mississippi State team, albeit, you know, one of the worst teams in the core four or, you know, power four right now. And I think when we look at it and we saw it against ULM, the infrastructure around Arch Manning combined with his elite arm talent should be enough to beat this Mississippi State team. When you look at the wide receivers, who he's throwing to, the tight ends, right? Texas has six to seven pass catchers better than anything that Mississippi State can put on the field. And we saw that last week. Elite plays by Ryan Wingo, elite plays by Isaiah Bond, elite plays by Matthew Golden and the rest of that wide receiver room, right? So when you talk about who Arch Manning is going to be delivering the ball to elite playmakers all over the field and then tight end one of the best in the country in Gunner Hill. Now, with Steve Sarkeesian, right, an elite play caller, which really helps, right? I talked about Oklahoma and how they don't have that. And you put a young quarterback, a very talented quarterback, Jackson Arnold, in a very bad position where he ends up getting benched because the infrastructure around him is not great, but not just the talent around him offensively. Also, the play caller not putting him in the best positions to succeed. Steve Sarkeesian, now with more data on Arch Manning after his first start, will certainly tailor it to Arch's strengths. And with, I think we'll see a lot of what we saw against ULM, right? Heavy run, right? Heavy on the inside run, heavy on getting that set up, and then a lot of play action for Arch, right? Not just dropping back and throwing it all over the field, but play action, you know, really manipulating the defense and really simplifying the reads for Arch Manning. When you look at the running game, right? What is the best thing to help out a young quarterback, right? The running game. And you look at it, Texas is averaging 190 rushing yards per game on the season right now and just ran the ball for 239 yards against ULM. They're going to come in this game and try to run the ball down Mississippi State's throat. And that is going to help Arch Manning a lot in his first SEC game if he is playing this Saturday. And when you look at the defense, right, the defense is not going to force Arch Manning into a shootout. At least I hope not. <laughs> when you look at it, this defense through the first four games, only allowing 212 yards per game and just allowed 111. So almost, you know, half of that to ULM, including only 10 yards in the second half. This is also a defense that has forced a turnover in all four games and going against a backup quarterback. Once again, Mississippi State without Blake Shapin will likely make it five in a row. Right. I expect Mississippi State to make a mistake and turn the ball over at some point, which will give more opportunities to Arch Manning and this offense. So when you look at it, you know, Arch Manning, right? Your backup quarterback, this isn't a Charles Wright, you know, no, no disrespect, right? But this isn't a Charles Wright, not even a Hudson Carr situation. Arch Manning is one of the most talented quarterbacks in the country. I've said, you know, even after, you know, his ULM start where he was staring down receivers and turned the ball over twice, Arch Manning right now, you can make the argument is a top 15 quarterback, you know, in the country, maybe top 20, just based on pure talent. And I believe that he could go out there on Saturday with the infrastructure around him. That's really important. The running game, the pass catchers, the offensive line, the defense, and the play caller. He can go out there on Saturday and beat this Mississippi State team that Texas is favored by almost 40 points against, which will allow three weeks, you know, a full three weeks of recovery for Quinn Ewers going into the toughest part of the schedule. Once again, the Oklahoma game and a neutral site. We know that anything can happen in that game every year, even as bad as Oklahoma looks right now. Although I fully expect Texas to smack up on Oklahoma the way Oklahoma looks right now and then the Georgia game. And I believe to beat those two teams or to be as competitive as possible against those two teams, Arch has looked great. But we need Quinn Ewers, right? We need quarterback one. We need our Heisman contending signal caller back to go out there and beat Oklahoma and Georgia. But I think this weekend against Mississippi State, and like I said, Vegas thinks it as well with the 38 and a half point spread, Arch Manning and company should be enough to go out there and win the SEC opener at home against Mississippi State on Saturday. A quick word from our sponsors, and then we get into some Longhorns in the NFL. They've been showing up and showing out. 
the first three weeks of the season. All right, today's episode of Locked on Longhorns is brought to you by FanDuel. All right, hey, NFL fans, you can start the season with a big return on FanDuel, America's number one sports book. So when you get a hunch in the middle of the game, you can check out the latest stats, view live, play-by-play, -play, and so much more on the same page where you place your bets. You'll get started with $200 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place your first $5 bet. That's FanDuel.com. Place your bets today. All right, so talking about some Longhorns in the NFL, you know, I've talked about this before, you know, through the first three games. I've talked about this before. There was a time, you know, a long period where Longhorn fans didn't have much to hang their hat on on Sunday, right? We, we weren't watching a lot of former Longhorns doing their things in the National Football League, but now you had 11 players drafted in this last one. Um, you know, obviously, you know, with the success Texas has had, you know, in the Steve Sarkeesian era, even some players from – um you know, uh, Tom Herman's era, excuse me. I already forgot about that brother that fast, but you know, even some players from Tom Herman's era were able to make it to the league, but we didn't have the development, right? A lot of talent was wasted. Now you're seeing so many guys that have transferred in or been recruited and developed, making it to the national football league and then being able to put on for the university of Texas at the national football league level. So these are just some of the, you know, household names, you know, household names, excuse me, from the university of Texas recently that once again are, you know, making a big mark in the national football league right now. I think the list has to start with B. John Robinson, right? He's on my fantasy team. We are currently on our way to a two and one, uh, you know, record through three weeks. And a B. John Robinson is a huge part of that. One of the best young players in the National Football League, uh, you know, period. And definitely one of the best running backs in the National Football League. And, you know, I hope that he can continue that for a long time. We've kind of seen the shelf life of running backs, you know, shorten up, right? We see running backs really kind of have like, four or five, you know, maybe six year primes, right? I'm hoping that B. John Robinson can bring back that 10 to 15 year career for a running back that we're used to seeing in the early 2000s and then early 2010s. But B. John Robinson has been absolutely exceptional through the first three games, 285 total yards rushing and receiving and a touchdown through the first three games. We saw last year that the offense really wasn't focused around a player like B. John Robinson, which sounded crazy, right? I mean, like B. John Robinson, I think he only got two, you know, touches within the five yard line last year. They just really weren't leaning on B. John Robinson enough. This new head coach and new offensive coordinator, they are leaning on B. John Robinson. And you were seeing the results of that. I know they lost a tough game to the Chiefs, you know, on Sunday night. They had a really good win uh, against the Eagles. Can't remember who they played in week one. So I think they're one and two on the season. But you can tell this Falcons team is a lot better. One of the biggest reasons for that, they're giving B. John Robinson the ball. Makes sense, right? The Chiefs. First round pick, Xavier Worthy, explosive, right? 120 total yards and two touchdowns through the first three games of the season. Obviously, he came on the scene in the first game, first game of the NFL season against the Ravens uh, with about 60 total yards and two touchdowns. Has slowed down a little bit in the last two games. And I really want to see the Chiefs be able to utilize him as a true wide receiver, right? We've seen him kind of, you know, catch a bunch of jet sweeps. Um, and, you know, kind of we saw the one route where, you know, he kind of just ran a go route and, you know, they left him alone in the secondary against the Ravens. He was able to score a touchdown on that. But since then, we just haven't seen him line up, you know, run routes and Patrick Mahomes throw him the ball. Right. It feels like everything to, you know, Xavier Worthy has been schemed up until this point. And I think, you know, based on what we saw at the University of Texas, he can line up out there, run routes, win his matchups. And get the ball from Patrick Mahomes. Now he's only three games in, you know, so that's something that, you know, we'll have to wait and, you know, potentially see as he continues to develop and grow in that offense, continues to develop his chemistry with Patrick Mahomes. Um, but, you know, even still 120 total yards and two touchdowns through the first three games. Great for Xavier Worthy. The biggest thing is the Chiefs are three and oh, but I expect to see him utilized a little bit more as we move forward throughout the season. Eleven targets thus far for the first round pick and Xavier Worthy. Adonai Mitchell, right? The Texas, you know, transplant coming from Georgia over to the University of Texas had a you know phenomenal year in 2023 for the Texas Longhorns, leading us to the playoffs, you know, helping lead us to the playoffs. Two catches for 32 yards in three games, but he's received 10 targets, right? He's been a big part of the Colts passing offense. The problem is the Colts passing offense really hasn't been a lot to write home about, right? You know, uh, Anthony Richardson has been so erratic that it's affected, you know, Adonai Mitchell's production. Because like I said, he's gotten 10 targets through three games, which is really good for a second round pick. He's obviously a part of the rotation, but he only has two catches for 32 yards. Like I said, he has 10 targets through three games. Xavier Worthy only has 11. So he's been utilized 
There's just not a lot of accuracy coming from Anthony Richardson at this point, and it's affecting Adonai Mitchell. But I expect things to iron out, smooth out over time. And you know, Adonai Mitchell should still up when it really still should should still end up with a really solid rookie year. Because like I said, he's getting the targets. They just haven't translated into catches and yards at this point. Taquan Grant, throwing it back a little bit, right from the Tom Herman era. Six tackles on the season. He's a def defensive tackle. You don't expect a lot in terms of that regard. But he's a huge piece up front for a much improved Falcons defense. I'm watching that game Sunday night, the Chiefs and the Falcons, and Taquan Graham just making a ton of plays. So I wanted to give him a shout out because he's just been doing his thing in the league for a long time. Doesn't get a lot of recognition, but certainly putting on for the 40 acres with his play. Tavondre Sweat, right? A fan favorite last year, All-American. He's been really good up front for the Titans. I know it hasn't really, you know, translated to wins thus far. I mean, when Will Levis is your quarterback, it's going to be hard to do that. Uh, but like I said, I've been watching, you know, some of the Titans and Tavondre Sweat and, you know, Jeffrey Simmons have been absolutely phenomenal up front, right? Right now, when you look at it, they're fifth in pass defense. So that's really good. 21st in rush defense. You would expect that to get a little bit better, but teams have had leads against the Titans and been able to just run the ball. You know, obviously the more the teams run the ball, the more yarders they're going to put up. But Tavondre Sweat certainly has been very good in the first three games of his career. His counterpart at the University of Texas, Byron Murphy, same thing. And the Seahawks defense, you know, they brought over Mike McDonald, the coordinator from the Ravens last year, who had a historical defense. And you can see through the first three games that the Seahawks defense is much improved. And one of the biggest reasons for that, you go out in the first round and you get Byron Murphy, arguably the best defensive tackle in this latest draft class. Like I said, the Seahawks defense has been much improved. I've been using them in fantasy. That's the reason I'm headed to a two and one, you know, record through the first three games. Now, they did just play, you know, the Dolphins without Tua. They did play Bo Nix in his first career start. So, you know, you could argue, you know, about the competition level, but you play who's in front of you. And the Seahawks defense has been really good. Sixth in passing defense right behind Tavondre Sweat and the Titans and then 18th against the run. And I think that run defense metric will, you know, get a little bit better over the course of the season. So Byron Murphy, very good. DeMarvian Overshawn, right? You know, drafted by the Cowboys last year in the third round, my Cowboys. It hurts to say that sometimes, but, you know, drafted in the third round last year and then unfortunately tore his ACL in the preseason. So this year is his debut, right? Even though it's his sophomore season, this is his first time playing NFL football. And he's been really good, right? 21 total tackles and a sack through the first three games. Obviously, the Cowboys defense last in the league in terms of rushing yards allowed. They haven't been great as a whole, but I think it's just great to see DeMarvian Overshawn on the field. And I think he's been really good in the opportunities he's been given. Just great to see him, you know, out there making plays. Jordan Whittington, right? Five catches for 50 yards on the season. But get this, right? He wasn't targeted in the first game at all. Then you have Puka Nakua go down to injury and he's on IR, right? So then you come back and you say, okay, we're going to feed Cooper Cup, right? Then Cooper Cup gets hurt in the next game and he goes on IR. And so now Jordan Whittington who was kind of, you know, made the roster, but was still a little bit buried on the depth chart. Now he's a huge piece of what the Rams are going to do, right? And in his first real action, the Rams upset the 49ers, right? In a really good game on Sunday. And so Jordan Whittington, I would expect, especially over the next two to three weeks, maybe even longer, while Cooper Cup and Puka Nakua are getting healthy, he's going to be a huge part of this Rams offense under Sean McVay and Matthew Stafford. We're going to see some really big plays from Jordan Whittington over the next couple of weeks in the National Football League now that he's getting his opportunity due to injury. And then we're going to talk about a couple kickers, right? Some of the greatest kickers the University of Texas has ever seen. Cameron Dicker, Dicker the kicker, a huge fan favorite. I was at the UTSA game. They put up, you know, Cameron Dicker on the screen. He got one of the loudest cheers, right? Probably like right behind Bijan, right? Like Dicker the kicker got the loudest cheers, right? He is beloved by University of Texas fans. Six for six on field goals thus far this year. Four or five on extra points, the first miss of his career. So he did miss an extra point, but he's been perfect on field goals. He got an extension in the offseason. Cameron Dicker, one of the best kickers in the National Football League right now. And then Justin Tucker. Right. He's been putting on for the University of Texas for a long time. Right. When we had to talk about Longhorns in the NFL, the conversation started with Justin Tucker, or, you know, arguably the most accurate kicker of all time has been in a little bit of a slump. Right. We saw it at the end of last year and it's kind of continued over this year. Five for eight on field goals this season, two for five on 40 plus yarders. He missed a 40 plus yarder and then he's 0 for two on the 50 plus yarders. Right. So, you know, Justin Tucker going through a little bit of a slump right now, still eight for eight on the extra points. Right. We know he doesn't miss anything under 40. Right. But the over 40 has been a little bit of a struggle for Justin Tucker as of late. And I saw a quote today that they said that it's a mechanical issue. 
right? You know, it's something in terms of his process, a mechanical issue, and they expect him to get it ironed out. You know, one of my favorite quotes of all time, Justin Tucker said he's a system kicker, right? I don't even know what that means, but Justin Tucker said he's a system kicker, and maybe he is, right? And maybe this mechanical issue is holding him back, but I want to see Justin Tucker getting back to that GOAT kicker status, right? When Justin Tucker used to run out there, it used to be automatic, and it hasn't felt like that lately, but I fully trust that one of the greatest Longhorns of all time, Justin Tucker, will certainly get it figured out right as he continues his hall of fame career in the national football league so a lot of longhorns doing some really good things in the national football league and i love to shout them out on locked on longhorns a quick word from our sponsors and we get out of here with the texas men's basketball schedule for 2024 2025 i expect it to be a really good basketball team at the 40 acres this season All right, today's episode of Locked On Longhorns also brought to you by 5-Hour Energy. 5-Hour Energy fixes tire fast. Whether you have a long list to do for work or a list of DIY projects to tackle at home, take a 5-Hour Energy shot so you can check everything off your list. If you are like me, you always have a large list of projects for the home. When you can get your supplies for the project, do not forget the most essential supply, which is a 5-Hour Energy shot. 5-Hour Energy is the brand hardworking people like you have trusted for over 20 years to give them the alert, energized feeling they need to get through a busy, hectic day. You always know where to find 5-Hour Energy shots right at the cash register at nearly every convenience drug and grocery store nationwide. Stock up on money-saving multi-packs to make sure you never run out of delicious, energizing 5-Hour Energy shots. If you go to 5HourEnergy.com, that is the number 5HourEnergy.com, and get some 5-Hour Energy product today, you can use my promo code locked on CFB to receive 20% off your order. This offer is only valid until September 30th on one order and cannot be used with other promotions. The code is not good on subscription orders. Go to five, the number five, ourenergy.com today. All right, a huge year for Rodney Terry and company. Rodney Terry's second full year at the University of Texas after taking over the basketball program from Chris Beard. Um, and I expect it to be a really good one, right? They have stacked this roster, brought in some really good players. Um, you know, Trey Johnson, the super freshman. Uh, you brought in Tremont Mark, you know, Jordan Pope. Uh, you know, some really good players from Indiana State. I'm not going to go through the full roster, right? But I expect this Texas basketball team to be really good. I think the Sweet 16 is the floor. Right. I think the sweet 16 is the floor and that's going to be a high mark. Right. And a mark that Texas hasn't, you know, met a lot in the basketball program. But I think this team will get to the sweet 16 or further in the first year in the SEC. This roster is absolutely loaded. And when you look at it, season starting before you know it. Right. In about five, six weeks, the first game, uh, November 4th against Ohio State in Las Vegas, then November 8th. November 12th and November 16th, you're back in the Moody for a three-game set against Houston Christian, Chicago State, and then Mississippi Valley State. November 21st and 22nd, you're going to be in the Legends Classic playing in Brooklyn, New York. I know Texas Tech is going to be one of the teams in the Classic. Can't remember the other teams at this point, but should be some really good games. November 29th, you're back in the Moody against Delaware State. December 4th, you're going to be at NC State for the SEC ACC Challenge. NC State was just in the Final Four, so that should be a really good matchup. Then you're back in the Moody for a five-game set, December 8th against the defending national champion, UConn Huskies. That's going to be a really good game. New Mexico State on December 12th, Arkansas Pine Bluff on December 15th, New Orleans on December 19th, and then Northwestern State on December 29th. Then your first conference game, you know, SEC conference on the road, the Cotton Holdings Lone Star Showdown, right, at Texas A&M, January 7th and January 11th at home against Auburn and Tennessee, two really primetime matchups in the Moody Center. January 15th and January 18th, you're going to be at Oklahoma and at Florida, respectively. Then January 21st and January 25th, you're going to be at home in the Moody against Missouri. And then the second edition of the Cotton Holdings Lone Star Showdown, January 25th against Texas A&M at home. January 29th at Ole Miss against that coach, right? Hashtag that coach. February 1st, you're going to be at LSU. February 5th, you're going to be back at home in the Moody Center against Arkansas and John Calipari in his new home. February 8th, you're going to be at Vanderbilt. February 11th, you're going to be back at home against Alabama, a Final Four team from last year. Should be a really good game. February 15th, at home as well against Kentucky. February 22nd, you're going to be at South Carolina. February 26th, at Arkansas against John Calipari. March 1st, back at home in the Moody against Georgia. March 4th, at Mississippi State. And then March 8th, your season finale 
at home in the Moody Center against the Oklahoma Sooners. So like I said, I expect this Texas basketball team to be really good this year. The Sweet 16 should be the floor, but I think they could even go further. National championship, I don't want to get crazy, but I do think this will be one of the best basketball teams in the country when it's all said and done. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Locked On Longhorns, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hook them. Peace.